All right, officially good afternoon, good morning, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Mitra Salasal, and I'm the Director of Communications at Ideas42. On behalf of all of us on the team, I'd like to thank you for joining us and welcome you to another installment of the Ideas42 Academy. Today, um, I am honored to welcome an extra special guest, Alison Daminger, who will be giving us a look at her work exploring how cognitive labor shapes our lives. Um, Alison is an extra special guest because not only is she an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, but she is an Ideas42 alumna, and we are very excited to have her uh, back at the organization organization and giving us a look at what she's been up to. Since leaving the organization, Allison received her PhD in sociology and social policy from Harvard in 2022. Um, her research focuses on how and why gender continues to shape our experiences at home and at work, even as support for gender egalitarianism keeps growing. She's published multiple academic articles on cognitive labor, um, one of which will be the basis for this conversation. Um, and she is currently writing a book uh, on this topic. She uh, is also passionate about translating academic research for readers outside of the academy, uh, which is something that I'm also personally a fan of. Um, and she writes a newsletter um, to that end that offers a sociological take on parenting and family life, which we will talk a little bit about more at the end of um, our session today. Uh, but before I hand it over to Allison to talk about time use and mind use, uh, a quick housekeeping uh, item for those of you who are new to the Ideas 42 Academy seminar series. Uh, we will be holding time at the end of the hour for Allison to answer your questions, um, but we ask that you drop your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can put them in there as they occur to you. You don't have to wait until the end, but we will um, hold all questions questions until the end of the hour. I um, believe that is everything I needed to tell you. So without further ado, Allison, over to you. Thank you so much, Mitra. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. As Mitra mentioned, I am an Ideas42 alum, and uh, my time there really played a pivotal role in my uh, career and intellectual development, as you'll hear in a little bit. So my talk today, as Mitra pointed out, is a uh, based on some ongoing research that I've been doing uh, since about 2017, calling it time use and mind use, how cognitive labor shapes paid and unpaid work. And by way of introduction, I want to tell you about a woman I had the privilege of interviewing, who I'll call Kristen. Let me tell you about a day in Kristen's life. Nothing special, just your average Wednesday morning. It's 6.40 AM and Kristen's in the kitchen face-to-face -face with a two-year-old. Ethan, the two-year-old in question, is what we like to call a handful, Kristen tells me affectionately. Right now, though, he's mostly hungry. So Kristen mentally ticked through breakfast options. I'm thinking about what has Ethan, Ethan eaten this week? What's stuck and what hasn't? Is he getting enough protein? And I'm also thinking about the timing of it all and the things that have to come after it, to clean up, to get him dressed, and on time for school. Eventually, she settled on scrambled eggs and some juice. According to the log Kristen kept that day and shared with me later, breakfast was over by about 6.50 a.m. But even as it was unfolding, Kristen's attention was divided. When she grabbed a couple eggs from the fridge, she noted a dwindling supply of both milk and yogurt and made a mental note to stop by the grocery store on her way back from daycare drop-off. While trying to persuade Ethan to eat the eggs, she saw some angry red blotches that had reemerged on his cheeks, and she decided to pull out the bottle of uh, allergy medications. By 7 a.m., Kristen was upstairs in Ethan's bedroom. As she rummaged through his dresser drawers, she suddenly recalled an email she'd received from his daycare, reminding her to clean out uh, the winter gear from Ethan's cubby. She'd already picked up his snow pants, but she knew he still had a few pairs of fleece pants that she should bring home. Along with Ethan's outfit for today, Kristen pulled out a few extra pairs of shorts and t-shirts to stick in his backpack so that he'd have some weather-appropriate attire when he inevitably needed a change of clothes midday. Finally, back downstairs, as she pulled on Ethan's shoes, Kristen's brain pinged again. She should probably pull Ethan's teacher aside to talk about potty training plans. He'd been having some success at home, and it seemed like a good time to start weaning him off diapers at daycare, too. <laughs> 
so what did we learn from Kristen's story? We saw her doing a few key activities. Among them, she was scanning for potential problems. Was Ethan eating enough protein? Did he have the right clothing for school? She was also making countless decisions. What should he eat? What should he wear? And then monitoring the effects of the decisions that she'd already made. Is it okay that he only ate half the scrambled eggs? Are his allergies back and should we make a doctor's appointment? What I would argue is that these activities are examples of labor Kristen is doing on her family's behalf. And yet the category that we normally house such unpaid domestic work under, housework uh, or sometimes household labor, is ill-equipped to capture these aspects of Kristen's day. Because the, the category of housework is normally focused on visible tasks such as cooking, cleaning, shopping, laundry, home maintenance, that are relatively easy to uh, quantify and to observe. And my work suggests that something is missing, right? And, and what I wanna talk about today is what exactly that missing piece is. So backing up, let me give you a, a, an overview of where we'll head in the next 30 minutes or so. I'll talk to you about the background of this work, why and how people study household labor and how they've done so in the past. Next, I'll spend some time on my research, telling you a bit about how I came up with the study and uh, its design. Third, I'll talk about what I found. And finally, I'll wrap up uh, to talk about some of the implications and what ongoing work I'm doing to follow up. Let's dive in. So first I wanna uh, to address some possible hesitation, right? Uh, about the importance of household labor. I suspect that since you showed up here today, you're probably at least a little bit convinced, but if you're on the fence, let me remind you about a little crisis we just went through. You may remember headlines like these how the pandemic could force a generation of mothers out of the workplace. America's mothers are in crisis. When society shut down a few years ago and many of us went home, the essential unpaid labor that was being performed grew in volume and in its visibility. There was more to do. In many cases, too much to do. Uh, my colleague Jessica Clarko uh, summed up the situation quite nicely when she said that other countries have safety nets, the US has women. The burden of household labor and its very unequal distribution across the US population suddenly became more apparent, even to people who had not perhaps thought very much about exactly how American households were running. Cool. So these COVID era headlines are in fact just the latest in what has been a long struggle over what exactly household labor is and what it should count for. On the surface, these are questions about the profoundly mundane, changing diapers, washing dishes, running a load of wash. But at a much more fundamental level, questions about housework are also questions about power. Who has it? Who doesn't? How is it wielded? They're questions about value. What does it mean to care for one another? How do we judge worth in the absence of familiar currency like money? There are also questions about equity and how we honor differences without reifying longstanding hierarchies. And for me and others in my field, uh, housework is an ideal lens for studying these important questions. And speaking of that field, I wanna give you a very brief uh, bit of background about how we got to where we are today in the field of housework studies. So for a while, this was the domain of home economists. Sociologists and economists were not focused on housework. They left it to the home economists who accepted it as women's work and sought to make it better, right? They wanted to elevate it to a science and help women to be more efficient and effective in their domestic labors. Meanwhile, sociologists, I tended to accept that women and men occupied distinct social roles, that was the natural way of things, uh, and housework was just you know, what women did while men were going out and doing productive work. 
And that narrative started to shift in about the 1960s when housework was increasingly recognized as productive work. And social scientists started to look at the distribution of housework within families as evidence of inequality, particularly regarding gender. Since then, studies of housework have really exploded. Uh, there's, I didn't, I didn't count them all up, but there are hundreds, if not thousands of articles looking at household labor in sociology, economics, and other fields. And they tend to coalesce around what I will call a time use paradigm. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Now, when household labor became an object of social scientific study, sociologists and others were interested in making this work concrete, quantifiable. They needed to agree on what exactly constituted household labor. So that's how we came up with the list of tasks I showed you earlier, which include cooking, cleaning, shopping, and so on. And they also needed consistent and comparable ways of measuring workload across individuals. So they ended up with time as the gold standard metric. And they use time in a few different ways. Some, sometimes uh, scholars will use surveys and will ask people to estimate how many hours they spent on housework or childcare in a recent week. In other cases, they will have people keep time diaries where they record in real time what they were doing, whether paid work or leisure or unpaid work. And uh, some studies use what's called an experience sampling method, where they uh, page or ping people at random intervals throughout the day and, and ask them to describe their activities. Now, the conclusions from this research are pretty consistent. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Women do more household labor and more childcare than men. Now, this has changed somewhat over time. So the graph you see here shows you that uh, among mothers and fathers, housework time started to converge quite a bit, right? The gap was huge uh, in the mid 1960s. And by about 1985, 1990, it was down to two to one, but it's plateaued and has not narrowed a whole lot since then. One other point I wanna make, because I get this question often is that if you add up the total amount of work men and women are doing, that includes both the, the work they're getting paid for and the work they're not getting paid for, we see that the, the hours are roughly equal. What's quite different by gender is the proportion that's devoted to paid and to unpaid work. Okay, so that's, that's the dominant paradigm. That's what I'm calling time use research, time use paradigm. But we have known for quite a while that these visible activities that can be measured on a uh, stopwatch are not all that's involved in running a household. I had some fun digging through the historical archives uh, for my dissertation and came up with uh, a woman named Hildegard Nieland, who was one of those pioneering home economists I mentioned. And as early as 1929, she was complaining about the problems with time use studies. She said the time which appears in the record will invariably be too low, since there's a lot of headwork that's done while the hands of the housewife are engaged in one of her manual tasks. Several decades later, uh, we have Arlie Hochschild introducing the concept of emotional labor or emotion work. Right? And she talks about that as intentionally managing and working to display your feelings in ways that are appropriate to the situation you find yourself in. And to give an even more recent example, there's a French comic named Emma who had a viral cartoon in 2017 about the mental load, where she uh, notes that the mental load means always having to remember. So we've known for a while, right, that the stuff that you can uh, record on a time diary is only a fraction of what's happening in households. We know the existing paradigm is insufficient, but what's the alternative, right? What should we be doing instead? And that's where my research seeks to come in. Uh, 
I don't usually tell uh, this part of the story in talks, but since I'm here and I'm just 42, I thought it would be fun to share a little bit of the earliest origins of this research. When I was at Ideas 42, I worked on a precursor to what's now called the economic justice portfolio. And one of the main texts that we were working from is a book called Scarcity, which I imagine many of you are familiar with. And it's through this work that I learned to think about cognitive bandwidth as a limited resource and decision-making as effort and work. So I left Ideas 42 and went to grad school and I started doing some exploratory interviews with parents about how they were making uh, decisions about where to send their children for school. And in these conversations, I heard a lot of we language. We did this, we did that, we decided this. But when I dug a little deeper, I realized that among heterosexual couples, the final decision about where the child should enroll was typically decided together but a lot of the preparatory work had been done by women. And that's what I wanted to investigate with my work. So I set up an interview study. Uh, I did in-depth individual interviews. In the vast majority of cases, I was able to recruit both partners or both spouses to talk with me one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And in some cases, uh, I was only able to recruit one partner. I targeted different sex couples with children who were under 15. Uh, I started out focusing just on college educated respondents, but later on broadened out to include a wider array of educational backgrounds. And where did I find these people? Uh, primarily via online parenting groups. So uh, parents of Somerville, moms of Brooklyn, things like that. I also established partnerships with several school districts that agreed to send home flyers about my study with all of their students. And I did some snowball sampling, which basically means that my participants recommended others who I might want to talk to. I want to briefly note that I have very recently recruited a sample of queer couples. Uh, the analysis is still underway, so I'm happy to talk about it in the Q&A, uh, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm focusing on the uh, heterosexual sample. Now, one uh, question you might have is, okay, if, if this work is invisible, if it's not quantifiable, how did you go about studying it in a systematic way? I had a few strategies. The first was to work backward from specific recent events. So I mentioned that Kristen kept a log. This was something that respondents did prior to our interview, where I asked them to make a note of the decisions that they made or thought about making on behalf of their family over, a course, uh, over the course of about 24 hours. And I use these decision diaries to structure the interview. I could say, oh, you made a decision about what to feed Ethan for breakfast. You know, tell me about how you came to that point. Uh, I also did a card sort exercise where I had a list of uh, both physical and cognitive tasks written on index cards and had people sort them based on who was responsible for them in their household. Uh, it was very helpful to have two partners' perspectives in the majority of cases, because I could compare the way that they talked about the same recent events. How much detail did they use? You know, who knew what? How did they describe their partner's role? And so on. In the end, I decided to focus on patterns of behavior, right? Looking at who led and who followed in various domains of household life as a rough proxy for workload. In terms of my participant demographics, uh, the results I'm sharing today come from 138 interviews with 63 men and 75 women who represent 76 different sex couples. Uh, this is a privileged sample. It's majority white, majority college educated, uh, very well off. And you know, that's an important limitation of these results. But research does suggest that we uh, would expect highly educated and higher income folks to be more egalitarian in their beliefs about gender. Uh, so to the extent that uh, my results are not representative, I suspect that uh, we're probably underestimating some of the effects of gender inequality. And finally, uh, I wanted to recruit 
samples of men and women who had roughly similar employment patterns. I didn't want to be conflating uh, stay-at-home motherhood, right, uh, with a higher cognitive labor load. So I, I tried to get um, some men as well as women who were working full-time, part-time, and out of the workforce. All right, let's turn now to what I found when I did this research. My first task was simply to come up with a precise taxonomy of the work that I was now calling cognitive labor. Because a limitation of prior research was a focus on very specific aspects of this work, uh, such as uh, relationship management, or to be an overly broad or vague category, like invisible labor. So what I came up with was a set of four tasks that tend to unfold in sequence. The first is anticipation, right? It's, it's looking on the horizon. What's coming up? What do we need to do? Next comes identification, where you are looking for options of meeting the anticipated need, whether that be uh, through formal research or just an informal brainstorm. Next, you need to decide which of the identified options are you gonna go with? And the fourth component is monitoring. We need to follow up to ensure that whatever decision you made was in fact executed correctly and that the original need was appropriately addressed. Since this is a bit abstract, I'll give you a concrete example. So, some of you may recognize this. Uh, when I started this work, I had never heard of it, but it's an okay to wake clock. Uh, parents like these for toddlers who have a tendency to get up early. Uh, so this clock turns green when it's okay to get out of bed and bother your parents. So this came up in several interviews, uh, but I'll tell you about a woman named Jennifer. She noticed that her toddler was waking up earlier and earlier, right? Coming into their bedroom uh, at 6 a.m., 5 a.m., right? Times when she and her husband would much rather be asleep. So this, this is the anticipation part. Something, there's a problem, there's an issue that needs to be dealt with. Next, she did some research. She uh, went online, posed a question in one of her Facebook groups, texted a few friends, and asked what they did. And she heard a lot of people mention this okay to wait clock. So she identified that as probably her best option and pulled up a few different models on Amazon. Next comes the decision stage, right? She said, okay, we're going to get one of these clocks and I'm going to pick a model that can be programmed for my phone. So that if we decide at the last minute that we want to sleep in a few more minutes, we can uh, change the, the settings and our toddler will be none the wiser. Last was monitoring, right? She bought the clock, she installed it. Is it working, right? Did I program it successfully? Uh, is my toddler following the instructions or do I need to go back to square one? So this four part process, this is an ideal typical model, right? In practice, many of these steps uh, run together. Sometimes it's an iterative process where you have to go back to the drawing board a few times but these are the basic components that I identified. Now let's look a little bit more closely at the qualities of those components. What effort do they require of us and what rewards do they offer? Because there's a, a tendency to you know lump everything together under the heading of invisible labor, uh, but you know I, I actually found that there's quite a bit of variation in visibility. Some cognitive tasks are more visible than others. Uh, the, the picture I have here is of a pantry because monitoring the supply of household goods was the cognitive task that was uh, least visible to respondents in my study. And when I asked them questions about, you know, who, who keeps track of when you're running low on milk or toilet paper, uh, a number of them had to really think hard to remember that that's actually a task that someone is doing um, and that you know uh, only gets noticed or commented on when it goes wrong. So anticipating and monitoring work uh, tended to be the least visible to spouses but also to the people doing 
that work. A second category is concreteness. And by that, I mean, to what extent is this a task that can be checked off a to-do list, right? Some cognitive tasks like registering for soccer or booking plane tickets are relatively easy to say, I'm gonna do this on Saturday morning. When I have hit submit, I will be done. But there are a lot of cognitive tasks, uh, such as managing a child's wardrobe that are much more amorphous and ambiguous. You cannot put on a to-do list, make sure my child has enough clean, well-fitting clothing, right? That's a task that begins at birth and ends, you know, who knows, 20 years later. There's also variation in uh, significance and the stakes of these tasks. Some cognitive tasks, as my respondents pointed out, are associated with power and influence. So things like managing a home renovation or deciding what school to send your kid to, right? Those are effortful tasks, but they also come with some rewards, right? You get to shape the direction the family takes on a consequential issue. Final characteristic uh, that, that differentiated cognitive tasks is complexity, right? How many inputs are you juggling? How many moving pieces do you have to hold in your working memory? Calendar management uh, emerged as one of the most complex tasks that many respondents had to deal with uh, on an ongoing basis. Okay, so we've established what this work is and what it's like. Now I wanna tell you about who does it, right? And again, I'm focusing here on hetero couples. So Kathleen, one of my respondents, is a guidance counselor uh, who I interviewed on a muggy afternoon. And she was refreshingly blunt. She told me about her relationship with her husband, Chris, this way. He sort of pursued me, we went out, we started dating. Now we have two kids and they live in this house with our hairy dog. But it was clear that she had deep affection for her family. Everybody likes Chris, she gushed. He's the nicest guy on the planet. But her one major complaint was that he doesn't anticipate. She said, I get so frustrated. Like if I don't tell him what to do with the kids, he doesn't do it. he will just sit around the house inside on a beautiful day and not do anything because he's like playing his guitar. I'm like, really? I have things to do. You need to do something with these children. This is what you need to do. I wish he would do that. Take the initiative. It drives me crazy. Now, it was clear that Kathleen tended to be the initiator and the task manager. But Chris was involved in any major decision. For example, a few years earlier, he'd been the one to advocate for a move to a suburb with a better school district. And when they needed to make an expensive purchase, which most recently was a new refrigerator, both partners weighed in on what they could afford, um, and Chris had been the one to do some online research. Similarly, Kathleen might be the one to identify which after-school activities to enroll their daughters in, but she would check with Chris before enrolling them. So Kathleen and Chris are typical of what I call imbalanced female-led couples. And I'm in the market for a catchier name, so if anyone has suggestions, feel free to put them in the chat. Like Kathleen, most women in heterosexual couples did the majority of cognitive labor for their household, about 82% of cases. And that was especially true of certain kinds of tasks. So among the most female dominated were childcare related cognitive tasks, uh, issues around relationship management. You know, what are we bringing for the holiday meal? Did we send a thank you card? And logistics and scheduling, that calendar management, who's going where, when sort of thing. There was no task category where men did most of the cognitive work, but the categories that came closest were maintenance, and finance, uh, followed distant third by food. Notably, I also examined couples' physical labor allocation, right? The stuff that would uh, normally show up in a typical time use study. And I found that, yes, physical labor was also female led, but less so than cognitive labor, right? More couples shared that work roughly equally, 
and there were usually smaller gender gaps in physical than in cognitive labor. So it's not that men were not contributing, right? Many men, uh, including Chris, were very active fathers and husbands. Chris was determined to be more present for his daughters than his father had been for him. And from what I could tell, he had succeeded. Kathleen explained, he's just very into the kids. Uh, he plays with them, he's fun dad. He's taking Chloe to Chuck E. Cheese on the last day of school. And indeed, while Chris and I did our interview, we sat at a picnic table in the backyard watching his youngest daughter play. And multiple times during the interview, Chris got up to attend to her. And she got stuck on a swing or wanted a snack or was afraid of a bug. But the contributions that men tended to make were higher in the physical labor arena. And in the cognitive labor arena, they were uh, concentrated in different areas. So you recall the, the four part taxonomy I introduced earlier. What I found was that anticipation and monitoring were overwhelmingly female-led in the majority of couples, right? So putting items on the collective radar and then following up later to make sure that they had been taken care of was uh, predominantly a female-led task. Identification work, right, that research stuff, was a bit more mixed. Uh, there were some couples where she did the uh, social research, right, polling friends, and he did the gadget research, for instance but the, the gendered patterns there were not as clear. Finally, decision-making was overwhelmingly a shared activity. If an issue rose uh, above the level of, you know, what are we gonna have for dinner tonight? Both partners tended to weigh in. Now, what you might notice about this pattern is that the most female-dominated tasks were also the most invisible tasks they were also the most abstract tasks, the tasks that could not be confined to a particular time and place uh, and were never quite done. By contrast, gender gaps were much smaller for tasks that were higher stakes and had the greater significance for families. Right? So when something like where we're going on vacation or how we should spend our money came up, both men and women were weighing in. Now, I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that every couple looked like Kathleen and Chris. Um, that was the most common dynamic, but there were others. So, for example, there were uh, roughly 10% of the sample was what I call balanced couples, <clears throat> excuse me, where both husband and wife <coughs> did roughly did roughly equivalent amounts of cognitive labor. Uh, there were also about 8% of couples, what I'm calling imbalanced male-led couples, again, need to workshop this, uh, where he did more of the cognitive labor. And one such couple, uh, I'll call it Antony and Siobhan. So Antony explained uh, when we met that my daughter and I, we're all about the routine. We know exactly what gets done when. My wife, Siobhan, is a little bit routineless, which drives me crazy. And this was my first clue that something unusual was happening in Anthony and Siobhan's household. Anthony, who's a software engineer in his late 30s, makes the meal plan and generates the shopping list. Though he does take feedback, uh, he said, from Siobhan on the dishes he chooses. Anthony researches flights and new restaurants to try. He creates monthly summaries of the family's financial picture. And he schedules uh, medical appointments, not only for his daughter, but for his wife. He described himself as a planful person who feels best when he knows what's coming next. And for her part, Siobhan, who's a policy researcher, identified as a little bit more laid back than her husband. In the early days of their marriage, and occasionally still to this day, Siobhan worried that she wasn't contributing enough. But over time, she said, I've become a little bit more okay with taking a bit of a backseat. As long as he's taking inputs, that is asking for her feedback before finalizing a decision, Siobhan happily ceded much of the household planning to her husband. 
right? So in many ways, uh, they sound a lot like the imbalanced female-led couples. But there were some differences. Siobhan played an unusually proactive role when it came to big decisions about their preschooler, Rory. So when it came time to find a daycare for her, for instance, the selection process was all me, Siobhan explained. Touring candidate centers was frustrating, she remembered, because everywhere we went, Anthony would be like, yeah, this is fine. And I'd be like, uh, no. But he pretty much left that decision up to me because he was like, you're the expert. You have very strong feelings about this. I don't. So in many ways, Siobhan and Anthony do look like the mirror image of couples like Kathleen and Chris. But there were subtle differences. For one, Siobhan was uh, quite a bit more aware of the dynamic and more cognitively, cognitively involved than men like Chris. Right? The gap between Siobhan and Anthony's cognitive contributions was smaller than it was for couples who were imbalanced in the other direction. And for another, Siobhan was especially active when it came to managing Rory's needs. She seemed to retain some oversight on big decisions like how to handle uh, an ongoing health problem or where to enroll her. And that was a pattern that was consistent across women in this uh, non-traditional category, right, where they seemed to be particularly involved in the cognitive labor of child rearing. Let me move towards some conclusions here. I've argued that the time use paradigm is incredibly important. It's, it's come a long way uh, toward helping us to appreciate and document what unpaid work is happening in households. But it's limited, right? It captures a small fraction of what it takes to keep a home running and children alive. We need to add mind use to the mix. We need to think about how people are using their attention, their working memory, their cognitive bandwidth. And when we bring that in, I suspect we're gonna find that our current estimates of gender gaps are understatements, right? If you recall, I found that cognitive labor gaps were uh, much more pronounced than physical labor gaps. I also see that there are qualitative and quantitative differences in what men and women are contributing to their household, right? Not only the amount of work they're doing, but the kind of work they're doing, how visible it is, how significant it is, how abstract. And these differences likely have consequences. So my research uh, is not set up to establish cause and effect. But when you put my findings in conversations with other work on gender and anxiety, for instance, I think it's reasonable to uh, hypothesize that the disproportionate cognitive demands that women in different sex couples are facing probably has some implications for things like their mental and physical health, uh, their well being, and even perhaps their career trajectory. And I'll put in a plug for uh, my. Uh, upcoming talk on November 17th, where I'll be back to focus more on this interface between paid and unpaid work. Finally, I want to briefly mention some of the other uh, related work I have going on in case it's of interest. I'm happy to talk about any of it in the Q&A. So first, I mentioned this earlier, but I've recently collected uh, data from queer couples, uh, both same sex and uh, non-binary and looked at how they share or don't share cognitive labor. I'm also doing a lot of work right now to look at how couples make sense of their cognitive labor patterns. Many of the couples I interviewed said that they very strongly endorsed gender egalitarianism, right? And so I wanted to kind of understand how they dealt with the gap between what they wanted and what they were doing. And finally, I'm uh, doing some work with collaborators looking at why the uh, COVID shock, right, uh, in fact failed to substantially alter most couples' household labor patterns. And I would definitely welcome your feedback. I'm on Twitter, uh, email, and as Mitra mentioned, I have a Substack. Um, so I'd love to hear from you there. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Allison. Um, before we get into uh, the Q and A uh, portion, we have a couple of questions already waiting in the the wings, so to speak. Um, a reminder to those of you who who may have joined a little bit late, because I understand we had some link access issues uh, on the Ideas Forty Two team side. Um, we are taking questions through the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. Go ahead and type them in there, and I will. Um, share them with Allison live. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention to everyone who is um, attending today is that Allison will actually be back with us November 17th, um, diving into uh, a little bit more of her, her research and her insights on building a caregiver friendly workplace um, and talking a little bit more um, on about those insights on the future of work specifically. Um, so, you know, make sure to tune into that. Um, and, and I'm sure that Allison will, will dive a little bit more into some of the, the workplace specific insights, but that is a good, um, transition to our first question. Um, and that is from Monacy, um, who asks if there's been research on imbalanced gendered cognitive load in the workplace. Um, we know that there's research about women engaging in more voluntary and less promotable tasks, uh, but curious if that trend has been investigated through this lens, Allison, that you've applied to household uh, tasks and cognitive labor. Yeah, that is an excellent question, Monacy. Uh, so you mentioned, right, this work on so-called non-promotable tasks, things like planning the office Christmas party um, or, you know, serving on a social committee. And as you reference, the finding is that women tend to do a lot more of this work. I don't know of research that has specifically taken this four part, you know, cognitive labor framework and applied it to the office setting. Um, I suspect that what we would find uh, might be a mixed bag. So, so two things. One, um, I do think that a lot of the cognitive work around uh, anticipating things like the needs of employees, the needs of customers, right? That I suspect would be more female dominated. But one of the things that um, I've noticed in my research and didn't get a chance to talk about here is that there seem to be uh, some, some different dynamics between work and home for my participants. So one of the examples I, I love to give is um, I interviewed several male project managers, right? Who basically told me that, um, all I do all day at work is cognitive labor. I don't wanna do that at home, right? And, and so I do think there's some reason to think that in this different domain, right? The public sphere, paid sphere, uh, we might see some different patterns, but if anyone is interested in uh, launching a study, I think there's a lot of room for more there. Great, thank you, Allison. Um, we have another question uh, by Anonymous uh, and a, a, a breaking comment from Monacy who says, let's launch the study. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, but we have a, uh, a, a question from Anonymous um, who says, I'm fascinated by the idea of a quote, balanced couple. Do you have any insights into how they got there or what the rest of us could learn from them? Uh, I would also like to plus one this question for myself. <laughs> yes, this is the million dollar question. Uh, what are the balanced couples doing differently? So this is a tricky question to answer because they tend to get to balance in different ways. So there are a couple features um, that maybe bad news and a couple features that are good news. So one, there seem to be some more uh, structural characteristics associated with balanced couples. And what I mean by that is um, there were no cases of balanced couples where the male partner um, both worked longer hours and earned more money, right? So there seems to be some uh, non-traditional paid work dynamic that is a prerequisite, at least for this limited sample. Right uh, now, the reverse is not true. 
right? If you are a woman who earns more than your husband, that was not a guarantee that you would also do less cognitive labor. Uh, many women both earned more and did more cognitive work, but among the balanced couples that did seem to be the pattern. But okay, you know, you've got your, your career, your partner's career, maybe that's not going to change. So what can you do? The other thing that I've found is that balanced couples seem to be a little bit more open-minded about who each partner is and what they're capable of. So imbalanced couples would tell me things like, she's type A, he's laid back, right? That's just how he's programmed. That's how I'm wired. And they would use this language as an explanation for why they did things as they did and uh, by implication, why it couldn't be otherwise. By contrast, balanced couples were much more likely to say things like, well, this works for us today, but we'll revisit it if it doesn't work. Uh, they also tended to be more aware of the ways in which they were making some choices, right? Uh, they, one of them used a metaphor, like if you're in a foreign city <clears throat> and you are uh, you know, exploring a new place with your partner, sometimes you're the navigator and sometimes you're the passenger. Right, and she said that I'm turning my navigator side off because I know that my husband handles it and I'm really focused on this career promotion. So that's uh, a couple of the things that I would say, but um, this is something that I'm exploring and hope to write much more about in the book. Great, thank you. Um, we have another anonymous question. Um, how much do preferences or characteristics like risk tolerance, ambiguity tolerance, or desire for control explain the imbalance? Um, is women's cognitive labor different because these things are more likely to put them on a different timeline of when they want to be prepared by? Yeah, this is a really great question and one that I have uh, wrestled with quite a bit. So here's what I'd say. Um, what I hear from participants over and over again is uh, she gets to it before I do, or we have different uh, levels of tolerance, right? We, I can go a lot longer than she can before realizing that this is a problem that needs to be taken care of. So that suggests that yes, there are some differences in preferences, uh, differences in you know, anxiety and how that manifests. But when I put on my you know, sociologist hat, uh, I think that there's more to it, right? So one of the issues is that the consequences of things going wrong tend to be born differently by men and women. And that's especially true when it comes to things like childcare. Right? If your child uh, shows up to daycare without the right attire, whether explicitly or implicitly, um, who's going to get the phone call? Who's going to get the uh, kind of reprimanding look from the daycare attendant? So what I think is happening in a lot of these cases is women are sort of anticipating that uh, consequence and, and trying to be proactive about dealing with it. As an aside, I was recently having a conversation with um, an economist who is studying some of these effects. Uh, and she's looking at when parents list both phone numbers on things like a school contact form, um, who gets the call more often, right? And, and not surprisingly, it's women. So I think we're starting to see some more evidence that uh, these preferences are to some degree a, a symptom of different societal expectations and accountability for men and for women. Uh, thank you, Allison. A follow-up question um, actually from me. Um, so a lot of what you've been discussing and answering the last couple of questions is kind of pointing to a theme around narratives. And, you know, at Ideas 42, we're doing a lot of work exploring narratives related to poverty. Um, and I'm just curious if you're aware of any work or if you yourself are planning on, on getting into any work um, in the space of, you know, identifying and, and potentially correcting some of these narratives that seem to be driving um, a lot of the assumptions, including, you know, the, the question that you just answered. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because that is really what, Nimitra mentioned I'm writing a book about cognitive labor and that's really the centerpiece of the book is this idea that um, 
the, the reason or one of the reasons that these cognitive labor inequalities are sustained, even among people who you know, aspire to do something different, is that we largely believe that they are a function of our personality, right? Um, basically what I find is that people are taking the content of older gender stereotypes and mapping them onto individuals, right? So instead of women are controlling, it's my wife is controlling. Instead of men are you know, forgetful, it's my husband is forgetful, right? And in doing so, it takes responsibility off of individual agency, right? You can't help it, this is how you are. It also avoids coming into conflict with people's ideas about, uh, evolving ideas about gender and how they want to structure their family life. And so a big uh, hope for me is to really hammer home that when we think of these uh, cognitive labor related uh, practices as a function of personality, they're actually more a function of skills. Right? So if you think about the skills that you bring to your uh, day job, if you're a knowledge worker, they overlap quite considerably with the skills that you need to be a good cognitive labor in the household. And yet men and women seem to be activating and using those skills differently. And so that, that's a big piece of this, trying to convince people that these are learnable skills, you have more agency than you might think. All right, thank you. Um, turning a little bit to a slightly different topic. This is a question from Al, uh, from Lori. Um, she is curious whether your subjects were surprised by your findings or if they generally validated what couples, perhaps especially women, intuitively knew to be true, or in other words, to what extent are hetero heterosexual couples aware of these imbalances in their lives? Yeah, so I would say there was quite a bit of variation. Um, it was actually quite amusing for me because there were moments uh, in some interviews where I could sort of see these light bulbs going off in people's minds. Uh, so to, to paraphrase one respondent, you know, she said, huh, it turns out when we talk this through that I do all the girl stuff and he does all the boy stuff, but I never thought about, about it that way. All right, so I think it's not that people were um, unaware of some of these dynamics, but they hadn't necessarily thought about them in those terms before. The other thing that I'm finding interesting in the research with um, queer couples is that they are much less likely to be surprised, right? Uh, it's much more common in those interviews for them to say, yeah, we have this dynamic, but we talked about it this morning, we know. Uh, so there, there seems to be a different level of introspection around these dynamics. And that's one of the emerging uh, differences. Uh, quick follow-up to that, because um, you I know you've mentioned that you're in the midst of analysis of uh, your your work with queer couples. Is there um, a planned channel or, or timeline for releasing um, th those findings or your resultant hypotheses from, from those analyses? Yeah, so the goal is to incorporate them in the book, um, but I can give you a, a quick preview. Um, so what I'm finding so far is that it's not that queer couples uh, automatically divide cognitive labor 50-50, right? It's, it's not that they're, um, they're sl slightly more likely to divide things equally than uh, hetero couples, but there's a lot of inequality there as well. But I'm finding that they are um, on the whole much more aware of those dynamics. Um, many of them talk about making mindful choices, you know, based on workloads and preferences. Um, and in place of this, you know, kind of uh, personality narrative, right, they tend to be much more um, idiosyncratic and specific in how they come to their labor allocation, right? So rather than things like, she's type A, he's laid back, they'll say, I think in time and he thinks in space, right? And so there's, there's much less mapping onto these um, broader social stereotypes. It seems that they are um, coming up with unique, arrangements, right, that, that fit their particular temperaments. Interesting. Um, 
shifting tactics again. And we, you know, unfortunately, I think we're coming up to the end of the hour. So I know there are some questions in here we will not get to, but I will pass these along to Allison um, for those of you whose questions we don't get to, um, to make sure that, um, you know, each of you has a chance um, to, to get an answer to your question. But um, quickly from, this is from Naira. Um, hi, Allison, is there any work you are aware of around quantifying uh, cognitive labor? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. Um, so yes, there is. Uh, there are a number of ongoing efforts uh, to kind of take this framework that I've laid out and figure out how we can measure this at scale. Um, so I've, I've had a number of really interesting conversations. I would say that nobody has quite cracked it. Uh, it's really hard to convert uh, these, these less visible, more amorphous uh, qualities into a quantitative scale, but I do think there are some promising efforts. Um, none of them, to my knowledge, has been published yet, but watch that space. Hopefully things will be coming down the pipeline soon. Um, great, thank you, Allison. Um, we do have um, a few questions uh, left in the queue, but we are at the end of the hour. So I'm going to share all of these with Allison. And if we have some time in the next installment, we can also start with answering these live because I suspect that each of the questions in here uh, will be interesting to, to the full group. Um, so Anthony um, on my team, can you make sure that you are capturing, capturing these um, um, so that we can port them over to the next installment, uh, which is a good transition. Again, the next time we will be together in the uh, Ideas 42 Academy will be November 17th, also with Allison Daminger, um, who will be presenting a look at building a caregiver-friendly workplace. Um, Reminder, we will be sending you a recording of this conversation, um, a link to the article that this lecture is based off of, a link to Allison's Substack uh, and uh, Allison's contact information. Um, and with that, uh, I want to thank each of you for joining us for the Ideas 42 Academy and extra special thank you to Allison Daminger for sharing your time, your insights um, and your research with us. Thanks, it's been a real pleasure. All right, we will see all of you November 17th in the Ideas 42 Academy seminar series. Enjoy the rest of your day and thank you so much.